Good evening, and welcome to Church of the Cross's Wednesday night teaching series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lisa Cerisi. I'm a professor of art history, and I specialize in sacred and devotional arts of the Christian period. And I'm in the actually conclusion of a three-part teaching series on the art of the early church. And I want to thank those of you who have been tuning in and sending me your questions and comments and all your experiences traveling throughout the city of Rome in particular based upon last week's material and even the invitations I've received to be your personal guide tour. Um, I do plan to go back to Rome someday, hopefully soon, so we can talk more about that a little bit later on. But what I'd like to do is to introduce the topic for tonight. We're going to be talking about Charlemagne or Charles the Great and the spread of Christianity in the West from the 8th to the 9th century. So that's part three and the conclusion. And I'll be talking about the Carolingian Empire. And if you look over here at the slide, you see that the dates for the Carolingian Empire, roughly 750 to 887, relatively short amount of time. And yet, a lot is happening. And that's what we're going to outline briefly tonight. Um, let me get my laser pointer go so I can point things out. One of the first things that I want to explain is how we get this term Carolingian. Carolingian comes from the word Carolus, which is Latin for Charles. And that's based upon a succession of rulers who took the name Carolus or Charles, like Charles the Great, Charlemagne, and then the heirs to his throne would then also take the name Charles. And I'm showing you here a picture of a coin, silver, that was minted probably around the year 814, the year that Charlemagne dies. And I'll address the significance and the symbolism of, them, of that a little bit later on. But what I'd like to do now is overlap a bit with last week's material and just review, you know, the world that Charlemagne would inherit and then briefly go over some of his major contributions. And then we'll start looking at the architecture and the art from that time period. So last time we talked about the fall of Rome how Rome was being repeatedly invaded by all these migrating Germanic tribes. And that's what those color-coded lines and arrows demonstrate. And you can see the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Huns and the Vandals, the Angles, the Saxons, all sweeping through the Roman world, leading a wake of destruction in their path. Now, what's going to happen? These migrating tribes, as they come into contact with Christianity, they're going to convert. Some of them will convert to the Orthodox faith, some of them to Arianism, which was one of those heretical factions. Eventually, they too will convert to the Orthodox faith. And then, those migrating tribes are going to settle. And I think I explained this last time as well. If you follow the map here, you can see some of the names of those tribes, like the Franks, for example, of which Charlemagne was part of, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths. So essentially, you know, to, what I would like for you to understand with this map is that those tribes are going to settle down and provide what will become the sort of the, the boundaries of the modern nations of Europe, like France or Spain, Italy, England, but that's yet to come. And once they settle down, I said that they will adopt the Christian faith or convert to Christianity. What I also want you to keep in mind, but especially before we start to look at some of the artwork coming out of the Carolingian context, is that these migrating tribes had nothing in common with the classical culture that was coming out of Rome. Right? We talked about Rome in the early Christian context and how those Christians adopted the Roman visual culture. In other words, they turned to Roman art for models. They adapted it, they modified it, they rejected the aesthetics, but in essence, they were largely indebted on Roman models. These migrating tribes had no such artistic traditions. Right? They had their own, but separate from the classical world. And eventually, they're going to come in contact with that classical culture coming out of Christian Rome, and we're going to see how that plays out, particularly in the time of Charlemagne. Now, the last map that I'm going to show you here gives you this sense or the boundaries of the Carolingian Empire. And like I said, it's rather short-lived, 750 to 887. And I'll explain how the Carolingian Empire comes to an end at the, the end of this presentation. But if we look at that area in sort of pinkish coral color, it gives you a sense of the boundaries of that territory that Charlemagne ruled over. And it included, you know, the modern countries of Germany, portions of France, Switzerland, Austria, and even sections of Italy. And we'll talk about that connection with Italy, very important in the time of Charlemagne. All right. The other thing I want to point out, too, is that you know, Charlemagne rises up in the ranks of that Frankish tribe. 
We talked about his grandfather, Charles Martel, last time and how Charles Martel was a, a, a general who fought back the expansion of the Muslims who had crossed over from Africa into Spain, but they never quite made it all the way into France because Charles Martel sort of held them back. And the Frankish people were basically uh, migrating, moving about from place to place until they eventually settled. So Charlemagne, when he's first crowned king of the Franks and a little bit later, king of the Lombards, that area over here, his court was itinerant, means that his entire court, his clergy, because at this time Charlemagne is a Christian like his father, but his court is moving about from place to place. Eventually, he's going to settle down in the city of Aachen, Germany, right there on the map. And we refer to that as North of the Alps. So Charlemagne is going to settle there in the area that was famous, even in Roman times, for its hot springs. And he's going to establish there a palace complex, a complex that will rival those palace complexes that were being built in Constantinople and in the city of Ravenna too. Last time I mentioned how Ravenna prospered under the imperial patronage of Theodosius' son, Anarius, and Theodosius' daughter, Galla Placidia. And Constantine would be very familiar with what was going on in Constantinople, uh, Charlemagne, sorry, was very familiar with what was going on in Constantinople and also in Ravenna. In addition, he'll be familiar with the era of Constantine in Rome. So in other words, Charlemagne sees himself effectively reviving the culture of those past imperial Christian leaders. So we're going to go back to this image here of that coin that was cast, again, sometime around the year 814. That's the year that Charlemagne dies. But the Carolingian Empire would endure for a couple of more decades beyond that. And what we see here on the coin is a portrait of Charlemagne. He has the laurel crown, the victor's crown. He appears in a toga. In many ways, this type of portrait, a strict profile, the toga, the laurel wreath, the victor's crown, is based upon Roman models the way in which the emperor was depicted, especially thinking back to Constantine, and we covered him last time. There's an inscription on the coin, Carolus, this is a K, the K and the C were interchangeable at this time in Latin, Carolus, his name, and at this time he had already received the imperial title, and I'll explain that in a moment, but the abbreviation IMP for the imperator and the title of Augustus. Right, and that's a title that, like I said, goes back to the days of Roman emperors and more specifically, Charlemagne aligning himself with Constantine, the first emperor to embrace Christianity. The other thing that Charlemagne would insist upon is this sort of motto or saying that he would have on his coins and on his official seal. The Renovatio Imperii Romani, a renewal of the Roman Empire. See, when Charlemagne wants to establish a presence in the West, that palace complex is going to, that he builds in Aachen, Germany, is going to be based upon models of imperial Christian Rome. You know, Charlemagne had a biographer, Einhardt, and I'll mention more about him a little bit later. And Einhardt, in the biography of Charlemagne, tells us that more than any other place, Charlemagne loved the city of Rome, the city of Peter, as he referred it to, St. Peter and the architecture associated with that imperial Christian city. So when we looked at the basilicas of St. Peter and St. Paul last time, Charlemagne would have his master builders very familiar with those types of buildings that were coming out of that early Christian context of Rome. So in other words, Rome will be the model for this new vision of an empire that Charlemagne is trying to fulfill. Now Charlemagne was a conqueror, he spent about 50 years of his life battling the Saxons, converting them to Christianity. If they refused, well, he would have to kill them. That's just how the world was, because if he didn't defeat them, they would have defeated him. So not only was he a conqueror expanding his realm, which would be a Christian realm, he was also a patron of learning, a scholar, a reformer, and a protector of the church. And in the next slide, I'm going to very briefly outline some of the highlights of his career, if you will. What Charlemagne would establish in that city of Aachen was the first centralized government ever in the medieval West. And from there, he would institute his polity. He would restore order, dignity, and literacy, right? The first time since the fall of Rome. 
And what he's also going to do is to initiate economic reform. He's going to simplify and promote trade and commerce. Essentially, he's going to unify the Latin West and the church in Rome with the rest of his empire. Very important, the relationship he had with the church in Rome, because Charlemagne is going to insist that the liturgy coming out of Rome will be standardized and spread throughout all of the Latin West. Very significant for the arts is the cultural revival. It is a, re a renaissance, a rebirth of classical culture that Charlemagne uses to, uh, to fulfill this vision. The arts and education are going to be essential, critical. If you want to spread literacy, it starts with education. Well, how is that going to play out? And we'll cover that uh, in, in a few moments. And very important part of this cultural revival was the court school. So it was a school associated with the imperial complex that he's going to have built in Aachen. And what Charlemagne is going to do there, he's going to handpick some of the most intellectual minds that he can find in the day, the literati as we refer to them. And they're going to teach a curriculum of the liberal arts. They're going to teach history, not just the history of the church, but also classical history, poetry, classical literature, in addition to theology, grammar, rhetoric, logic, astronomy, arithmetic, horticulture. You know, the medicinal properties of plants and herbs was very important. It came from the ancient world, goes back to the ancient Egyptians, even the Phoenicians. And that information was, you know, copied by the Greeks and the Romans, and now it's going to be part of the cultural revival taking place in the Carolingian Empire. And we'll also have the biblical commentaries. All right, so he gathers with him the most intellectual minds that he can find in his day and age and brings them there right to the city of Aachen. He's also going to fund monastic expansion, the Benedictine order. We'll be talking about Benedict of Nursia and the establishment of the Benedictine order, which will become, in most part, the most prevalent form of monasticism in the West. Very significantly, in the year 800, so after Charlemagne settles in Aachen, after he's got his palace complex under construction, the Pope at the time, Leo III, invites Charlemagne to the city of Rome. On Christmas morning, very famously, in St. Peter's Basilica at the altar of St. Peter, Pope Leo III crowns Charlemagne the emperor of a newly forged Roman Empire. It was an entirely new title. And what that did politically was to place Charlemagne in a direct line to Constantine, right? the first Christian emperor who embraced, uh, the first Christian emperor. And this is a new title, and it's a title that will continue on until the 1700s, or actually 1806, with the last of what we will call the Holy Roman Emperors, when Francis II, I believe it is, abdicates to Napoleon. So it's the first in a long line of coronations that would be granted by the Pope. And the tradition was that it had to take place in the city of Rome, in St. Peter's. All right, that's a lot of history there, but it's, again, just some of the highlights. So what I'm going to show you now is a reconstruction diagram of the palace complex that Charlemagne had his master builders create in the city of Aachen. Now, what we have to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, the Frankish tribe of people that Charlemagne was from, they had no tradition of monumental buildings. They were itinerant. They moved around from place to place. They never invested the time or the energy into building large-scale structures. So when they did need, have the need, when the need uh, came about to build this elaborate complex, Charlemagne would send his master builders to cities of Rome, Constantinople, and Ravenna, among other places, for the inspiration, for those models. And when it came to the layout for that palace complex, Charlemagne's builders based it upon the layout of the Lateran Basilica and the residence. If you remember last time, we talked about how Constantine donated the Lateran Palace to the Bishop of Rome. And that would be the official residence of the Bishop or the Pope. And that also was a church was built there. We looked at the marble steps, according to tradition, that were taken from Jerusalem and brought into that precinct by Helena, the mother of Constantine. So my point of explaining that is that the Lateran Palace and the church would have been a model for the layout of Charlemagne's palace complex. When it came to the individual buildings, which I'll identify in a moment, he based them upon Roman building types like the basilica or the round building with a dome. And he even had more specific models in mind. There were churches in Constantinople, 
There were churches in the Holy Land, especially the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that associated with Constantine and as well, and also in the city of Ravenna, an imperial church and, and complex. We didn't cover that last time in detail, but nevertheless, Charlemagne was familiar with it. And so too his master builders. In fact, he had his master builders take pieces of marble from those structures in Rome, in Jerusalem, and the city of Ravenna, and transport them all the way to the city of Aachen. And when you think of the logistics of hauling large pieces of marble clear across the map, it would have been more effective to use local building materials, which they did. But he wanted to make a point to communicate something about this new complex by bringing what we call spolia, building material from those other monuments in, again, the Holy, from the Holy Land, from Constantinople, from Ravenna and Rome, it was communicating a message about the transference of power. All right, so we call that spolia, use, reusing building materials, but with a, a, a political agenda in mind. So here I want to address the, um, the layout of that complex. Now, most of this no longer exists, but what we have here at the heart or spiritual heart of his complex is the chapel that he had dedicated to Christ, or I should say consecrated to Christ, but dedicated to the mother of Jesus, Mary, St. Mary's. And that was his beloved chapel. I often refer to that as the, um, the Carolingian octagon or the, the, uh, the, the palace chapel, because it was at the center of his palace complex. And this type of a building, round with a little dome, reflects the types of buildings that the Romans constructed and then the Christians continued. To that, he had these little extensions here, which looked like the basilicas. And a little court, an atrium in front. If you remember, old St. Peter's, St. Paul's outside the walls, also had that atrium, right? Rome was the model, imperial Christian Rome. Over here, the main gate entering into the complex and also a court of law. Over here was the audience hall where Charlemagne, as king, would then greet his subjects. Today, this audience hall still survives. It's the town hall for the city of Aachen, but it has a very different profile because each generation added something to it or modified it. There were also residences here for the servants. Over here, there were the residence area for the families, the imperial family, and for the high church officials. And oh, back here, the baths, the thermal baths, the hot springs, which we know that Charlemagne absolutely delighted in. And remember, um, the city of Aachen was an old Roman colony noted for those hot springs, and that was the spot that Charlemagne chose to have that elaborate complex built. We even know the leader of that, say, workshop of building, the master mason, Otto of Metz. Much of this is recorded in Charlemagne's biography, written by Einhardt. What I'm going to do is show you the uh, cutaway view of the chapel, the way it would have looked in Charlemagne's time. It was a two-story structure, so it had an upstairs called a gallery. It's a very small, intimate setting. And what you see here in this cutaway view, it's circular, but actually the inner core over here has eight sides. The outer core has 16. And there's number symbolism going on there that is symbolic of the heavenly city of Jerusalem. The outer perimeter of the cupola here measures exactly 144 Carolingian feet. And when you think about it, the numbers 8, 16, and 144 all share common multiples. And that evokes the measurements that are given in Revelation 21 of the 144 cubit feet that the angels used to draw up the plans of the heavenly city of Jerusalem. So in other words, the dimensions for this particular chapel were to evoke the heavenly Jerusalem. And that was deliberate. There was a huge tower in the front, massive fortified tower. And then at the gallery level, so the first floor up as the Europeans say, Charlemagne had installed his imperial throne. And we're going to look at some of these in, in detail as we move ahead. The inside of that dome, which we refer to as the cupola, was decorated, painting and mosaic. And I'm going to show you what it looks like today. Now, here's the interior view of that original Carolingian core. And much of what you see on the surface of the walls and the floor, even what I'll show you a view into the cupola, much of that has been replaced. 
but it remains faithful to its original Carolingian content and subject matter. So here you have the central of that octagon, an elaborate chandelier with 48 candles, once again playing into the number symbolism of 144. But this was donated much later on in 1165 by yet another emperor whose name I'll mention towards the end of this presentation. There's the gallery level. Now the next view I show you is going to be directly above that central core into the cupola, where today there are mosaics. The subject matter, Christ in majesty, being adorned by the 20 and 4 elders. So the 24 elders there, dressed in white robes, have removed their crowns and they're casting their crowns at he who sits on the throne. This is a reference once again to Revelation 4. There's Christ in majesty. You can count up these figures in white. Their crowns are removed. They're earthly rulers, renouncing their earthly authority at the feet of he who sits on the throne right, for the second coming. In addition to that, we have the four symbols of the evangelist. And I'll explain this. That comes from Revelation 4 and also an Old Testament passage of Ezekiel. But that's just to give you an idea of the subject matter that once decorated the interior of that dome. All right. Here's a very dramatic view of that dome, the inside cupola. The windows are called the clear story with rays of light streaming through. And you can imagine how that would rotate around over the course of the day. And then there's the chandelier, once again donated around 1165, but nevertheless creates a very dramatic interior view. You know, when these churches were built and furnished with objects, especially objects that would be used during the liturgy, you know, the designers took in mind human sensory perception. What would things look like visually? It was very important to connect to human perception to create a very dramatic, almost like stage-like setting for the, the concept of God's presence, right, being felt or seen spiritually within the church. All right. As we go to the gallery level, directly above the entrance, so here's the main door that you walk in even today, directly above that, so on the west side of the church, Upstairs is the imperial throne. And in this slide, it may not come through so well. The columns to both sides of that imperial throne are made of porphyry, which is purple marble, the most expensive marble. And because it's the color purple, it has associations with imperial qualities, the royal color. Those columns were taken from Ravenna, from a church there associated with the emperor Justinian, and then brought over to Aachen. Once again, transplanting, right, the spolia, reused material, to make a point, to communicate a message that the transference of power has now been granted to Charlemagne. And here's his imperial throne. Now, we don't know if Charlemagne was actually seated upon this throne after his imperial coronation in the year 800. But what's interesting is that um, modern scholarship has proven that the marble that was used for this throne, here you see a picture of it, comes from the city of Jerusalem. It matches up with the marble from other constructions, like the Praetorium of Pilate, for example, or the marble that was used in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The shape of the throne was meant to evoke the throne of Solomon with six steps. You'd have to start down here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then the throne with a round back. Now, those of you who are familiar with the throne of Solomon from 1 Kings chapter 10 realize that that throne was made of ivory. But nevertheless, it's very explicit about the six steps and the round back. This throne here is made entirely of marble. Originally, the seat of it would have been covered with um, uh, elaborate cushions and pillows, right? more befitting of a king and, and now the emperor. But the idea there was to connect Charlemagne to Solomon and to David even before. Solomon. The idea that Solomon was a wise ruler who governed his people justly and in a godly way. You know, there would be many attempts in the course of the Middle Ages throughout the West and even the East where kings, rulers, emperors would associate themselves as a David or a Solomon because of their position to govern people justly. For the floor... 
So the base of that, and this is all original, inlaid marble. This technique of inlaying marble was based upon a Roman technique called opus sectile. It's basically when you take pieces of marble or glass, as the Romans did, and you inlay it to create these beautiful patterns, usually geometric shapes. And the type of marble that the Romans used was very costly. Marble comes in all different colors and veins. And the, there's purple there, there's shades of pink and green, brown, and beautifully veined. And the way in which they were arranged would call to mind a major monument in the city of Rome. This monument here is known as the Pantheon. So what I'm showing you now is the interior of one of the, the highlights of, say, construction during the high imperial Roman phase, the Pantheon, which originally was built as a temple dedicated to all gods. However, in the year 609, that Pantheon was consecrated a church. And it was dedicated to Mary and the martyrs. Many people don't realize that even today, the Pantheon, major tourist spot when you visit Rome, is actually a church because it was converted back in 609 and it continues to function as a, as a church, a basilica title it has. But what I want to point out here, the floor that you see with all this beautiful inlay marble, opus sectile, is original. And much of the marble on the walls that you see here and here is also original. So Charlemagne had his architects evoke that language associated with Imperial Rome. Back here you can see in this little recess area signs of the cross which show when that pantheon was consecrated as a church it got rid of all indications of the pagan state religion meaning that the paganism of, of Roman mythology and instead put the symbols of the Christ there. But that's just to give you an idea of one of the monuments that Charlemagne would have had his architects turn to for inspiration in fulfilling the vision of his complex up there in Aachen. Here's the exterior of the Pantheon. Some of you again have uh, told me wonderful stories that you shared with me about visiting it. The exterior of the Pantheon would have had a very different finish, right? a highly polished, almost marble looking surface. Today you see it in the concrete and the brickwork, but that would have been concealed. But nevertheless, that gives you an idea of what it looks like even today. I'm gonna take you back to Aachen, back to the Imperial throne. All right, so that floor there, the marble inlay, evokes the ancient city of Rome, imperial Christian Rome. The steps here, all right, was meant to be an evocation of the throne of Solomon and the shape of the back as well, the rounded shape. Now, what's interesting too is when you start to examine the different, say, viewing points within this little chapel and you're directly behind that throne, so it's not the greatest slide, it's a little dark here, but we're, we're directly behind the throne. So Charlemagne and the heirs to his throne would have been seated in this throne in that gallery level. And that would have provided them a perfect view into the cupola of the image of Christ in majesty. Now remember, we said that the Christ in majesty here is being adored by the four and 20 elders, earthly kings who have cast their crowns at the feet of he who sits on the throne. And by placing the imperial throne at the gallery level with a perfect view of that, the suggestion was that Charlemagne and his heirs to that empire consider themselves continuing in the tradition of earthly rulers who will cast their crowns during the second coming of Christ. In many ways, the, um, the emperor, or the Holy Roman Emperor, as we we're going to start to refer to him as, saw himself assigned a very specific role of delivering his people and his empire to the Christ during the second coming. The eschatological role of the king or the emperor to present the empire to Christ at the second coming. And part of that was to renounce earthly authority, cast off your crowns. And that idea of lining up the image here directly as the emperor was enthroned was a very important line of vision inside that chapel. All right. So there again is the uh, lateral view of the throne. Today, it's chained off, so you can't get too close unless you get special permission. But part of the tradition in the Middle Ages, especially after the time Charlemagne died, right? Charlemagne dies in 814, he's buried inside this chapel. 
and the chapel takes on yet another level of meaning. It becomes an imperial mausoleum. See, when Charlemagne first built this chapel, in part, the plan was to house a collection of relics that he had received from the patriarch of Jerusalem. The patriarch of Jerusalem, the head of the church in Jerusalem, had given Charlemagne, in the year 799, he had given him relics. Relics associated with Christ's passion and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Charlemagne had those relics preserved inside this chapel. So it became a pilgrimage church for the faithful to come and to be near the relics, but also to pay tribute to Charlemagne, who was buried inside that church. And part of the tradition was for pilgrims to crawl underneath the throne of Charlemagne. People would line up for hours, days in advance, just to have the opportunity to crawl underneath that. And that would be part of their pilgrimage. Even royalty right, would perform that act, crawling under the throne. Here's a view of, of Aachen, the way it looks today. Since the 1920s, Aachen is the, uh, the St. Mary's is the cathedral of the city of Aachen. And the profile that you see testifies to, to years and years of rulers making contributions in the form of building additions, like this section over here was added in 1414. Other sections were added over the course of time. The original Carolingian profile is this octagonal building with the dome, the bridge here, and the tower. These spires belong to a later time period. Whenever you see something really pointy and soaring up high like that, that belongs to generally the, the Gothic period of construction. But this tower here, the bridge, and that central core would have been part of Charlemagne's original chapel. Everything else was added onto it. You know, what I find fascinating about visiting the city of Aachen and the cathedral, the people there are still very proud of their history and of the relics. And this picture here shows one of the principal relics that Charlemagne had received from the Patriarch of Jerusalem. The tunic, which many believe was worn by Mary while she was nursing the Christ child. Now, whether it was worn by Mary or not, that's not the point. The point was it was gifted to Charlemagne and ever since the year 799 has been protected in a type of container inside that church. What we see here is a picture of two canons. The canons run the, uh, the church today, even though it's a cathedral, the seat of the bishop. And they're displaying that relic. You know, among the other relics that were gifted to Charlemagne was the loincloth that people believed was worn by Christ during his crucifixion, something that was wrapped around his waist. That they don't open up, but rather stays folded. But yet it's put on display as well. And I'm showing you pictures that were taken probably in the year 2007. That's the last time that I've been to the city of Aachen during the major pilgrimage. And that pilgrimage, with the exposition of those relics, took place every seven years beginning in the year 1238. So starting in the year 1238, long after Charlemagne dies, the relics were put on display. And without exception, even during wartime, those relics were exposed to the faithful, to the curious, to the tourists. You know, you go during the, what they call the, the, the year of the pilgrimage. The next one in Aachen, I believe, is in 2021. And people will line up hours in advance just to get a glimpse. Whether they're faithful or curious makes no difference. And some tourists, or even, or I should say scholars, are even given access to the area underneath the throne. Now, even though technically this is cordoned off, you can't go under there, if you show up enough of times and just smile and be polite, they'll eventually let you crawl under. I did that, I guess that was back in 2007 or around that time period. I was surprised, it's actually a very tight squeeze to get under there, but nevertheless, I did it. My pilgrimage to Aachen was completed. All right, what we're going to do now is turn to the court school. That group of literati, the intellectuals that Charlemagne would gather right there in Aachen in order to initiate this revival of literacy. And how are you going to make people literate again? It all starts with books, right? The production of books. And what we have to realize by this time, there were still some books coming out of Rome that uh, were used as models 
for these Carolingian scribes. Scribes are, are the, the name of the person who copies books, edits them, revises them, illustrates them. So Charlemagne would gather again the, the greatest minds and bring them to the court school in order to oversee the production of books. Now the room that was assigned for the production of books was known as a scriptorium. I didn't write that word down, but scriptorium would be the single room. Scriptoria is the plural. And in these scriptoria, all areas of knowledge would be taught. As we said, not just the history of Christianity, but also classical history, ancient history, literature, the liberal arts, all right? That list that I gave you earlier on in this presentation. Now, among the books that would be edited, revised, copied, and illustrated were liturgical books for the church's services. Books like lectionaries, all right? Psalters, the book of Psalms, sacramentaries, which are like missals, books that would be used during the celebration of the mass. Also produced in this time period for the first time in the West was the Bible as one complete volume. And the Bible that would be produced would be the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Hebrew and the Greek that was done earlier on, say around the year 420, completed by Jerome. I mentioned him last time. Remember, Jerome is living in a cave in the city of Bethlehem, and he's copying diligently the or I should say translating the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin. And that Latin Vulgate would be the official Bible for the church in the West until the Reformation, when we start to get the Bible translated into the vernacular, the common languages of the people. So it was very important to have a very clean, edited, revised copy of Jerome's Vulgate. Classical history, as I said, literature and poetry, all of that. Now, the other thing that Charlemagne would insist his scribes do is to clean up the script, the handwriting, because it was virtually illegible. And if you're going to teach people to read, if you're going to educate them, you have to make sure that they could read the text. And the two types of handwriting that we're going to see consisted of majuscule, which are capital letters, and minuscule, which are a lower case. For the majuscules, they're going to turn to the Roman style of writing, Roman capital letters. For the minuscule, the lowercase, they're going to come up with their own, Caroline minuscule. That may sound familiar for those of you who play around with the different fonts on your computer, but nevertheless, we, we refer to those as scripts or hands. The first book that I'm going to show you here was a gospel book. Now, you know, there's a lot of history going on with the formation of, of books. We're looking at a format called a, a codex, so our current book format, which consists of folios, that's the word we use for pages. The transition from a scroll to a codex took place much earlier on. Once that's probably by the late 300s. So by this time, book production is done in the codex format. This book consists of just the gospels that were bound together. The Bible, like I said, as one complete volume was not produced in the early church. That would happen in this Carolingian period. So what they did instead was to just bring together certain books of the New Testament, like the four Gospels, or the book of Revelation would be its own book. The Psalter, the book of Psalms, would be its own book. The books of the Old Testament, the first five, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that would be its own book as well. All right, it wouldn't be until, again, much later in the Carolingian period that we get the Bible as one tome, one volume. Getting back to this here, this Gospel book was produced for Charlemagne, perhaps for his imperial coronation. The book is made up of, the pages are made up of animal skin. They're called vellum, right? Animal skin, the hide had to be cleaned, stretched, prepared to receive the paint and the pigment. The folios, the pages, are dyed purple, the royal color. The writing, the script, is in liquid gold and silver. Right, this is an imperial commission. It gets the name Coronation Gospels because, as I said, it could have been used for Charlemagne's coronation. But later on, after the year 1000, this book would be the official book that each heir to the throne of Charlemagne would take a vow to uphold right, the, the, the kingship or the title, the imperial title that we receive by placing two fingers on the open book near the Gospel of John. And that's where the book is open to, the Gospel of John. Here's the text of it. Here is a full page illustration, the author portrait, meaning a portrait of the evangelist John. And there's another view of it. The purple doesn't project very well, sort of looks muddy brown, but nevertheless, the imperial purple and then the gold and the silver. Now for the, what we call the author portrait, 
that we see here, it shows looking much like a Roman author, robed in a toga, a big halo, noting that it's a saint, St. John the Evangelist, his manuscript and his stylus, writing down the word of God. And then here begins the gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, all right? And then you could see the I and the N from the Latin in principio, erat verbum. In the beginning was the word. Here is another folio which shows yet another evangelist. This is Matthew. And it's treated the same way. Purple dyed vellum, gold and silver frame, and we get the full length portrait of the evangelist busy at work. And when you look at these images of the author portrait, they certainly call to mind the way in which the Romans painted pictures or the early Christians painted pictures of significant figures from the Old Testament or the New Testament. But what's happened here now is that concept of the author portrait, the, the scholar or the philosopher, has been given over to the evangelists. And, you know, some people could easily mistaken them for looking Roman because they do look Roman. See, Charlemagne insisted that his illustrators create imagery based on Roman models, reviving Roman types. The Carolingian scribes did not understand the aesthetics behind Roman art. All they had to do was copy Roman models right, to, to revive that culture. And the Frankish people had no tradition of the human figure prior to those scribes coming in contact with Rome. What I'm going to do is show you an example of Frankish art. This is going back a bit to the 7th and 8th century. The Frankish people, who were those migrating tribes, they had no grounding in the classical culture. Remember, they are the ones that are sweeping across, looting, plundering, stealing. Eventually, they'll convert to Christianity. But the type of art form they did produce was essentially jewelry. And you look at these beautiful brooches. They were functional because these as brooches would have held like a clasp that held their cloaks in place. They're made of the most precious materials, gold, silver, gemstones. And they exhibit some of the most highly skilled methods of jewelry making, filigree, enamel work, cloisonne, for example. And when you look at the details like this, this is exquisite, highly skilled. They did not make large scale art, didn't make sense. They're moving about from place to place. They didn't want to be burdened down. So they made small portable objects like this. And much of this jewelry making lacked the representation of the human figure. When they did represent, say, objects from life, like animals, like this here, a bird, they're very abstract. We call it a zoomorphic form because it's an abstract animal form. It's a bird, and they emphasize the beak, sometimes the talons, maybe it's a hawk or an eagle. This, too, is a very complex jewelry-making process where they would take, a, say, a base metal plate, either copper or silver, cover it with gold, and then create little gold walls by taking strips of gold wire, soldering it to that base metal plate, creating little compartments, cloisonne, like cells, and then filling it either with cut garnet or enamel work. A very long, tedious process, time-consuming, certainly, but these were the types of objects they made. Again, they're not grounded in the visual culture that's coming out of Christian, say, the classical Greco-Roman tradition. When they do come into contact with Christianity, now they're going to create art that reflects the Christian faith. And what I'm showing you here was produced by the Franks in the 8th century. It's round. They were comfortable creating the round objects like we saw with that brooch. But if you look at this at first glance, you may have no idea what you're looking at. And that's why I brought in our icon from Mount Sinai from the 6th century. Because this here we said was the Pentocrator, the Almighty. Christ emphasizing, right, the two distinct natures in one person, the divine and the human, the gesture of blessing, the book of life, and the halo with the sign of the cross. The more closely you look at this here, this Frankish piece from the 8th century, you realize something, ah, there's a face here. There's the eyes, the nose, the head, there's the halo, and the three bars, the sign of the cross on the halo reserved for Christ. Over here we have the alpha and the omega. Here are the book. Here looks like a green rainbow, perhaps the reference to the emerald rainbow encircling the throne in Revelation 4. Hands, perhaps? And then this here, we're not quite sure, perhaps they're meant to represent the sun and the moon. We don't know. They're just there. They were part of that sort of pre-Christian Frankish tradition 
now carried over into this medallion that represents Christ, the Pentocrator, the Almighty at the Second Coming. So when Charlemagne has his court scribes turn to Roman models, that's when we start to see, once again, figures like this popping up. Right? A big difference between the evangelists here in terms of how they physically appear and the image of Christ done in this, this 8th century brooch. And that type of a brooch would have been worn, say, by, by a priest on, on his cloak. What I'm going to turn to is another folio from yet another gospel book that was produced at the court school in Aachen. This is a, dates to the year 820, so after Charlemagne's death, but for one of the heirs to his throne. And it's a full-page illustration that shows all four evangelists, the authors, on one page, as though each one is within his own landscape. And, let's see, and I'll show you details in a moment. And once again, these figures of the evangelists and the landscapes are based on, on Roman models, Roman landscape paintings, the Roman author portrait. This happens to be folio 14, verso. You know, the way in which we uh, describe the pages inside a manuscript, manuscript means uh, written by hand, is the folios. You have a top side, which is the recto, and you have the verso, which is the bottom side, so a top and, and a, uh, a back side. Here's a detail of the evangelists. And over here, again, they look like the Roman author portraits. They're seated, they have their little footstools, their lecterns, they have their codex there, and their stylus, and they're busy at work. But what I want to point out here and talk about the symbolism are the symbols here that are associated with each one of these evangelists. Like in other words, here we have a winged man or an angel. That becomes the symbol for Matthew. The eagle, with the halo and the book and its talons there, becomes the symbol for John. Over here, once again, we have a very Roman-looking author, but that's meant to be Mark. And how do we know? Because the figure here of a lion with wings. And over here, the last of the four evangelists, Luke. And there's his symbol, an ox with wings and the halo and the book, like the, other, the others have. And we said, well, how do they get those associations? Where do those symbols come from? Well, they came from the early church. And this is how it's broken down. These illustrations obviously are, are modern, but it gives you an idea of the way in which they've been depicted. In other words, Matthew is shown as an angel or a man. Mark, we said the lion, Luke the ox, John the eagle. The source of that is biblical, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. The vision that Ezekiel describes in the first chapter of the chariot with the stormy wind and the flames of fire, and within that, the tetramorph, the four faces, the creatures that he sees, one with the face of a man, another with a lion, an ox and an eagle. And above that vision with the chariot and the wheels and the flames of fire is the Almighty. So it's an appearance of the Almighty surrounded by these four figures. In the New Testament, we get in Revelation 4 a very similar vision of a tetramorph described by John, where we have the four living creatures, the face of a man, face of a lion, an eagle, and an ox. And he goes on further to say how their wings were studded with eyes and how they praised the Almighty, holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they glorify and honor him. So from those visions of Ezekiel and John, we get the symbols of the evangelists. But some take it even further and say, well, why is Matthew the man? Why Mark the lion? And so on. Well, if we go back here for a moment to the details... Those of you who are familiar with the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew gives us the genealogy of Jesus, how Jesus became man through that ancestral line. Therefore, Matthew is assigned the man. Right? Jesus made man, or God made man in the, in the person of Jesus. Whereas John, John's the eagle. John's the visionary, like an eagle and the sight of an eagle. And when we think about John's revelation right, and the visionary, that's included in there, well, that was an easy one to assign. When we get to Mark, the lion, the voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths, were the words spoken by John the Baptist, right, as he emerges out of the wilderness. So when John the Baptist cries out, prepare ye the way of the Lord, it was likened to a lion roaring in the desert. And that's why Mark is associated with a lion. As far as Luke, Luke's gospel begins with the priestly sacrifice 
of Zachary or Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist. And traditionally, the sacrifice would have been an ox, a slaughtered ox, and therefore that becomes the symbol of Luke there. And that becomes pretty standard in the depictions or to the symbols of the evangelists. And there's the full page again. All right. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. We looked at examples of, of the manuscripts that were produced at the court school of Charlemagne. Now, what's going to happen is th those intellectuals that Charlemagne had handpicked, right, to, to bring about, once again, um, some type of a, a, a literacy and education, they're going to train a generation of scholars that are going to be placed in monasteries, monasteries that are going to be financed by Charlemagne. And they're going to produce yet another whole generation of scholars. And we're going to see that it's through the spread of monasticism that literacy is once again going to spread throughout the West. And the type of monasticism that will be prevalent in the West is that founded by Benedict of Nursia. Benedict of Nursia died around the year, I guess it was 547. And he goes down in history, among other things, doing, he was the father of Western monasticism. He founded an order of monastic life known as the Benedictine Order, or OSB, the Order of St. Benedict. And he came up with a very rigorous rule book. Right? And part of the requirements for this religious order was the Opus Dei, the work of God, which was prayer. Prayer at least eight times a day at designated hours. And when they weren't praying during what we call the canonical hours, from morning through the midday to the evening, they were engaged in labor. Because you see, these monastic communities were self-sufficient. Charlemagne is going to finance these monasteries. He's going to provide them with everything they need. He's going to make sure that the abbots and those who are going to oversee the court, the, I should say there's the schools within these monasteries who came from originally from the court school at, at Aachen, they're going to now be placed within these monasteries and educate the next generation in that scriptorium. You know, monasteries were the sole source of education throughout this time period and would remain so until we get to the high middle ages. And Benedictine monasticism, very simply put, uh, as I said, it's sort of a, a self-sufficient community. They walled themselves in for protection. Remember, they're still living in a world that's marked by lots of warfare, so they need protection. And I'm going to show you a, a model of a type of a monastic community in Charlemagne's time in a moment, but I want to go over this for a moment here, what we call the canonical hours or the divine office or the liturgy of the, the, the hours. These were designated times. There were eight of them that Benedict uh, came up with based upon the old Jewish tradition of praying at designated times of day. The most important were the morning hours and the evening one. And then there were shorter ones during the course of the day. So a total of eight. So not only did these monks or nuns, because they were convents too built in the Benedictine order, required to do hard physical labor for a self-sustaining community, they also were required eight times a day to stop what they were doing, to enter into the church that was at the spiritual center of their complex, and pray. Benedict was famous for finding that monastery in Monte Cassino in Italy, which is some 81 miles southeast of Rome on the top of a hill. The structure that's there today is not original. It was rebuilt after World War II. The British Air Force had bombed the, uh, the earlier monastery when Italy was part of the Axis powers. All right, so what I'm showing you here is a ground plan, a drawing, which gives us the idea of, a, of an ideal Benedictine monastic community while reflecting the logic of Carolingian planning. This here is the original parchment or vellum that it was drawn on and it's illegible. So we just go by this diagram here. This ground plan shows us that the basilica was at the heart of that monastery. Then over here, we have a covered walkway attached to the church. We're gonna call that a cloister now. And the cloister provides protective coverage for those monks to go in and out of certain buildings, buildings that would be most frequently used throughout the course of the day, like the dormitories, the bathhouses, the latrines, the refectory where they had their meals, the storage rooms, the kitchen. And those would be the ones that they would pass through most times of the day, cleaning themselves up before they would go into the church, into the choir section, which was near the high altar, and then 
celebrate that divine liturgy, the divine hours. The other buildings that you see surrounding it here are essentially subsidiary buildings used for daily life. And they included barns, workrooms for blacksmiths, for carpenters, uh, little kitchen gardens where herbs could be grown that could be used for medicinal purposes, cemeteries over here, you can see it, a hospice, an infirmary, a guest house over here. There's the school with the scriptorium. See, Benedictines were required to extend hospitality to anybody who came knocking on their doors. So they had to provide the means for people to rest, provide them with food, provide them with comfort if they were sick and dying. You know, these monasteries were really the sole places for any type of health care throughout the Middle Ages. To prepare herbs and plants for medicinal purposes, to administer to the sick and the dying, to ease their pain so that they could die a dignified death. All of that took place in these monasteries. This here is a model, sort of a 3D model from that ground plan. And this was based on a model that was drawn up by an abbot, Haito of Reichenau, which is a little island on Lake Constance today. And he drew this up to give to a friend of his, who was another abbot of a monastery, at St. Gall in Switzerland. It was never built as designed, but what it does is reflect the clarity and the sort of the rational layout of a self-sufficient community. Right? That's what's important here. And it would be within those rooms, like I said here, the mills, where they were assigned labor. Here's the refectory, the dormitories, the latrines. I mean, they even had advanced hydraulics right, that allowed water to come through and provide them for the bathhouses and the latrines. And notice here the stream made sense to build a complex near running water so it would power the wheels for the mill. You know, these, these monasteries really reflect the most intellectual thinking of the day. All right, basically, in that sense, like it was an oasis of inte intellectual think tank, in, in a sense, all walled in for protection. It had to be because, as I said before, there was still lots of warfare going on. And it would be in those, uh, those scriptorium where the books would be produced. And that's what we're going to look at again. One of the things I said about book production was cleaning up the text. Here's what handwriting looked like before Charlemagne insisted. Let's clean that up to make it legible. All right, you look at something like this here, and you probably can't imagine what this is meant to be. Now, it's written in Latin, but we could still identify the alphabet of the Latin language. But this is illegible. If you want to educate people, they have to be able to recognize the letters of words. So Charlemagne insisted they clean it up. Here, just for fun, I've transcribed it. This here, N-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, this is the N-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. This is a G-R-E-G-E-S, and then you can see the rest here. Apostoribus, here's an A. Notice the A is opened at the top. P-A-S-T-O-R-I-B-U-S. This is an excerpt from Gregory the Great's book on pastoral care. That was copied throughout the ages. And that particular passage translated says, should not the flock be fed by the shepherds? It actually comes from the book of Ezekiel but nevertheless was used by Gregory when he was coming up with his book on pastoral care. But my point of showing you that, again, is to point out how illegible the handwriting was. Charlemagne insists they clean that up. And to show you an example of Carolingian script, I chose a Bible, or I should say a folio from a Bible, a Bible that was produced in one of those monasteries that was founded in the Carolingian Empire. And it was St. Martin at Tours. Alcuin, who was handpicked by Charlemagne to supervise the court school in Aachen, later on, Alcuin of York, up there in uh, Northumbria, Alcuin goes to Aachen, and then from Aachen, he is assigned to be the abbot of this monastery known as St. Martin at Tours, where he is going to oversee the editing, the revising, and the production of single-volume Bibles based upon Jerome's Vulgate. What I'm showing you here is a folio which begins the book of Genesis. Notice how the col there are two columns, right? That type of a format dates to this time period. Even today, you get some Bibles that are written in two columns, right? The origins of that go back to this time period. Just for fun here, we'll look at the lettering and to see how easy it is to recognize the letters of the alphabet. These are the majuscules, I, N, C, P. This bar up here tells us it's an abbreviation of the word 
in Chipit. Means begin here the book, L-I-B for Lieber, which is also abbreviated, so the E and R aren't included, and that's what this bar indicates. Here begins the book of Genesis. But the point is, again, look at how legible these letters are compared to our previous example. And then, notice over here, we got the chi, rho, alpha, and omega. Right? That harks back to the time of Constantine and now is revived here, because this is the, the Old Testament book of Genesis, but nevertheless, in the Christian Bible. And then, this over here, I'm going to go back to this slide for a moment, this here is an initial I. And it's called, it's a decorated initial. So they make it more elaborate. And that I gives us the first letter in the word in. Because now begins the book of Genesis. In principio creavit deus. Chalum et terum. The letters are easy to recognize. Even if it's not projecting well because it's gold written on purple, it may not be legible on your screen. But nevertheless, capital letters, the majuscules. And then the lowercase, the Caroline minuscule. C-A-E-L-U-M. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And then we have here, terra autum erat in anis et vacua. And the earth was void and empty. See, Latin isn't that scary, right? Once you get the practice and you could read the letters. But that's the point. It's legible. Here's another folio. This is the frontispiece from the same Bible. And this is folio five, verso. And here we have pictures, a narrative that gives us the accounts of Genesis 2 to 3. Now, one thing I want to say is because when we have pictures in books like this, those who would have had access to these books were literate. So the pictures didn't have to play the role of telling the stories because the person couldn't read. The person who had access to this certainly could read. But what these pictures would do is to help them locate certain passages or chapters within the book. You know, if you have a Bible today, you flip through it, you're going crazy to finding a certain book unless you have a tab. Well, they didn't have tabs on their pages, but rather, if you had a full page illustration like this, you could immediately recognize the subject because of the picture and then know where the text is going to be. So in this case, pictures play what we call a, either a mnemonic device, reminding us of something that's there, or to locate a certain passage. Just for fun, we're going to look at the pictures and see how easy Carolingian art makes it to understand what we're looking at and therefore find a certain passage in, in the, uh, the large Bible. Here's the scene of creation. God the Father in the form of Christ with the halo, so we say Christ is the logos, very hands-on process of creating Adam from the earth. Two angels stand on, remember, in that orant position. Over here, and I'll show you in the detail, God the Father's removing a rib from Adam while he is sound asleep. I probably don't even have to tell you the subject matter here because you could figure it out for yourselves. You know the story, you look at the picture, it seems very obvious. And that was the point, to make it clear and direct, to communicate this narrative. The face of God the Father, very similar. I should say Adam's face, very similar. Makes humankind in his own image. Here, he's removing the rib from his side. And notice that gesture there indicates that Adam is sound asleep. And what we're going to start to see in Carolingian art and beyond is how the illustrators emphasize certain features, like the eyes are enlarged, the hands are enlarged, the gestures are enlarged, so that we can focus in on that and understand the narrative a little bit better. Here, God introduces Eve and Adam. He explains to them what trees the fruit they could eat from and which one was strictly forbidden. And there, once again, a large gesture there too. So this is the woman who you are giving to me. You could almost put your own captions there. Here, he explains, look at the size of his hand. It's like a gesture of blessing, you know, telling them what they can and cannot do in that garden. And as we know, how the story turns out, I think I have a detail there. There's the serpent coiled around the trunk. Eve's tempted. She shares that with her husband who willingly takes it. And you can see, right, the look in their eyes, almost as though they're questioning, should we be doing this? And here, when they are aware that they've sinned against God and they conceal their nakedness, and look at that accusatory finger of God, right, and how oversized it is to get our attention to understand what's going on here. 
And if you look at it carefully, right, God the Father looks directly in the face of Adam. He's hunched over. His body communicates shame. He looks down, covers himself. But as he's covering himself, he's pointing. This woman who you put here with me, well, she made me do it. She looks at her husband and says, well, honey, you know, you did it well. But after all, it was the serpent who tricked me. I kind of add it to the story there. But you get the idea based upon the pictures. And then the final register there, they're cast out of the garden and given their assignments. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. All right, as he says to Eve, and there she is nursing her child. And there you see the thorns and thistle and the herbs of the earth and Adam toiling the soil as a farmer. For dust thou art and into dust thou shalt return. Okay, so that was the large Bible books. And from that monastery of St. Martin and Tours, there would be at least four full volume Bibles that have survived from that time period. Now, even though the Bible was now being produced as one volume, it wasn't the norm, right? It wasn't widely circulated. Basically, they went to other monasteries where they could then be used for copying and illustrating their own new books. And it won't be probably until around 1200 that the Bible as one complete volume will start to be in greater circulation. That's just gonna take a while before that. And you know, people have to ask why. Well, if you think of the expense to produce a Bible, right? I think that kind of explains a lot. The next type of a, of, of a book that I'm gonna show you here is a sacramentary. So it's a type of book that would have been used by the priest during the celebration of mass. This happens to be just one of my favorites. It's the historiated initial, something that the Carolingians contribute as well. It's taking the letter T, like you see here, the first letter in the word T. There's another word, igitur, you therefore. It's the beginning of the prayers associated with the Eucharist. Here's the T, the E, we have an I, a G, I, whoops, sorry, the T, the U, and the R. The te igitur. The next word will be clementissime, which appears on the next page. And what they do to those letters, giving them prominence, but then within the frame of it, here at the terminals, and then there at the crossing, little pictures or a story, which is why we call it the historiated initial. Now you can imagine when you have the missal up on the altar and the priest is reading the prayers associated with the mass, or I should say the celebration of the Eucharist, what we call the canon, they're flipping through the pages to find the right passages. And how easy it would be to locate this passage by that letter T. Right? So again, it's like a mnemonic device. Now, most of the priests who were the celebrants would have this memorized, but sometimes they get caught up in prayers and they kind of lose their place or forget. This would be a reminder. So once they got those first two words, te igitur, then they know the rest. And it's smooth sailing through the rest of the prayers. So in that sense, they, they operate as mnemonic devices to trigger off their memory. Here's the picture at the crossing of that T. And it is like the shape of a cross. The Old Testament, Melchizedek from Genesis, a sacrifice at the altar up to God the Father. There's the hand of God the Father accepting the offerings. And notice how beautifully decorated. This is all gold and purple. This was made for Bishop Drogo, which is why it's called the Drogo Sacramentary. So it's a generation after Charlemagne. There's a detail of it. Notice the size of his hands. All right, again, emphasize so we understand that there's an offering up to God the Father. At the terminals, we have the offering of Abel, the little lamb there. So Old Testament prefigurations and Abraham offering the ram. Down below, oxen, which again, were the types of sacrificial animals he frequently used in the, um, the Jewish ritual. And there's the, the tegi tour, and right after that comes this page here with an elaborate frame with the capital letters, C-L-E, M-E-N-T-I-S-S-M-E, Clementissime. And this, as I said, is the beginning of the part of the canon of the Mass, the Te Igitur Clementissime Pater. Father, we humbly beg of thee and entreat thee through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, to deem acceptable and bless these gifts, these offerings. They're presented here in the guise of the Old Testament prefigurations, but the understanding is that this is the Eucharistic prayer book that the priest would recite from. 
All right. One last item we're going to look at is this elaborate gospel book, a cover. And I mentioned before that some of these manuscripts had elaborate book covers. Well, this is probably the most elaborate that I could find, and it comes from the Carolingian period, one of my favorites. It's called the Lindau Gospels today, but um, that's based upon the manuscript that's inside, which wasn't produced at the same time as the cover. So we're only going to look at the cover here and get an idea of the type of imagery and the symbolism associated with that. And here you have a frame, an elaborate frame, decorated with all types of mounted gemstones. In the center of that is a cross with Christ on it, and that creates four quadrants. These book covers are made of like a board of wood that's covered with a metal, usually something like silver, because it's a little bit more durable than gold, and then it would be covered with a sheet of gold, and then mounted with gemstones and all sorts of gold wire, reflecting all those techniques of jewelry making, which were such an important part of the sort of the pre-Christian northern people, once they convert to Christianity, they put all those artistic efforts to these types of objects that would be used in the Christian ritual. One of the first things I, I want to point out is the image of Christ on the cross, right? So it's a crucifixion, but it's again, not the suffering Christ. Like we saw in the early Roman period, Jesus there on the cross, but very much alive, his eyes open, his body displayed, a perfect sacrifice, the idea of the heroic torso rooted in the classical tradition. That idea carries over into the Carolingian. But we're going to see more symbolism that's evolved since then. They're still uncomfortable showing Christ's suffering. What they will show, however, in those four quadrants, like you see here and here, are figures of angels lamenting, expressing grief, and Marys and John also, who witnessed the crucifixion, all sort of hunched over, with exaggerated gestures of grief and despair, lamenting over the death of their friend. And here we get closer to it. And as I'm showing you these details, please, you know, do take a look, appreciate the fine craftsmanship of all this sort of gold wiring, little balls of gold soldered together in strips of wire, right, and then applied to the surface, and then all these mounts with gemstones. They're raised up so light could pass under it and, and bring out the brilliance of them. And all these figures here and here, I'll show you even closer details. Notice above Christ's head, there's a halo with gemstones. There's the plaque. Hic est rex judaeorum. Here is Jesus the Nazarene. And then we have figures here that are sleeping. One has a sickle moon over its head. They're personifications of sun and moon. Clusters of gemstones here. And there's the detail of the sun the moon and the sun. Now, that symbolism of the sun and the moon appears now with the crucifixion. And on one level, it's a reference to the Gospel of Matthew that tells us now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the whole earth. An eclipse. But there's another level of meaning to it that was described by the early church fathers, which is actually biblically rooted in a prophecy of Joel. Let me go to this for a second. And briefly, I've outlined it, right? In the prophecy of Joel, it foretells the day of the Lord. And if we read this here, at their presence, the earth had trembled, the heavens are moved, the sun and the moon are darkened. So it's a reference to that eclipse, right? That was taking place during the crucifixion. But see, then the early church fathers, like Theophilus of Antioch, he wrote that the sun is the image of God and the moon is the image of man. So in other words, sun and moon come to represent the divinity of God, the sun, and the humanity, the two distinct natures. The moon is the humanity, symbolizing the humanity of Jesus. And then Ambrose tells us in his commentary on the six days of creation, that's what the hexameron is, he, meaning Jesus, has emptied it, the moon, in order to refill it. And think of the moon, the cycles of the moon, the new moon, the full moon, and then as the moon reappears in different stages. He who has emptied himself to refill all men, for he emptied himself that he might come down to us. He descended to us that he might ascend for all. The moon, therefore, announces the mystery of Christ. So what this has done is basically put the waxing and the waning of moon reflecting the incarnation, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. It's an endless cycle, right, of, of new moons and... and full moons and repeating itself. You know, 
the early Christian world, and pretty much through the Middle Ages, saw everything that was created around them by God to somehow manifest the virtues of God, that in everything they saw, whether it was the sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the rock formations, somehow it symbolized God's existence, God's ever eternal existence. Let's have a closer look at the figure of Christ there. We notice on the cross, he's got the wounds, all right, so they will represent that, and it looks like blood flowing from them, little clusters of grapes it resembles, right? The grapes symbolizing the wine that will be used then during the celebration of the Eucharist, and even there from his side. This is the figure of Christ there is made from a thin sheet of gold, probably three millimeters thin. And it's hammered from the back, right, to pop out, to make it look really solid. But it's very thin, very fragile. And then the fine details are done from the front side. And here's some more of the details of the gemstones mounted in those quadrants. These blue stones here, that's called a cabochon cut. It's irregular. They didn't facet stones. That wouldn't happen until much later on. Whenever you see a faceted stone and something like this, you know that that's a modern replacement. But this would be an original. And this, this blue stone rises higher than the ones surrounding it. And in fact, that's a very practical reason for that because each of these stones, I seem to have lost my laser there, each of these stones that you see here at the center of that little round cluster is higher than anything else. And that was a way of protecting all of these figures should the book be opened up and placed on a lectern. The weight of the book would crush in the figures if it were not for these stones that are raised higher protecting it. There's one of the lamenting angels, the exaggerated hands, eyes shut, expressing grief, hunched over. Right? So the body language communicates, as well as the gesture, the concept of grief. And there's Mary Magdalene with her long hair, also looking up towards the crucified Christ, but the triumphal Christ. Here's the book from another angle. And I love showing it from a different angle, because when you look at it strictly from above, you miss this here, how it rises up like this. All right, we said these blue stones at the top are higher than anything else to protect it. And here you see another angle. There's the figure of Christ on the cross. And notice all right, that cross, very prominent. All right, Christ in the center of it. When you look at an angle like this, you realize that that cross is made up of, and I'm going to show you one more detail, little rounded arches called an arcade like that. Looks like a building. And when you think about the plans for early church buildings, the basilica was in the shape of a cross. So we're to understand this as a little church, what we call microcosmic architecture with Christ in the center. With that idea in mind, mini architecture or microcosmic architecture, we look at this here. This looks like a little round building with a dome on top. And the most significant centrally planned, so a round building with a dome on top, was that built by Constantine over the tomb of Christ from which he resurrected. What I'm showing you here is a diagram of the profile of the building by Constantine, known as the Holy Sepulchre. This dome and then a round base like you see over here. It's not replicating it with accuracy, but it's evoking the shape and the symbolism. The dome here is often referred to as the anastasis dome, meaning resurrection in Greek. So what we have here is a reference to the two different types of churches that were being built, especially in the time of Constantine, the basilica and the centrally planned domed building. And then if we keep that in mind of buildings, and you think of it as a pavement, right, a base or a floor, and you think of all these gemstones that are part of the foundation of these buildings. Well, I'm sure some of you are thinking about Revelation 21, John's vision of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And what I've done is highlighted some of the key words here that I want to bring attention to. Right? In John's vision of that celestial city, he tells us that it was adorned with precious stones, jasper, gold, sapphire, chalcedon, emerald, sardonyx, all those stones you see encrusted in the cover of that gospel book cover are described here. And then he goes on to say that the 12 gates are 12 pearls, right? The pearly gates of heaven. 
and the street of the city was pure gold. I mean, you could imagine how these goldsmiths delighted in the opportunity to use these precious materials to create a vision, an evocation of the holy city as described by John in Revelation 21. And that would be a justification by the church to use such precious materials for objects that were used in um, the liturgy, right? Because that gold and, and gemstone brought to mind the heavenly city. Here's another view of that uh, gospel book. And like I said, we're only going to look at this top cover because that's the part that dates to the Carolingian period. So that's pretty much the material that I wanted to cover for tonight. There's a, another view of the book. I never get tired of looking at it. But just to kind of wrap things up for tonight, all right, I mentioned throughout this presentation, Charlemagne died in the year 814. He was entombed in his chapel. The Carolingian Empire ends by 887, right? And in part because when Charlemagne's heirs, his sons and his grandsons, inherited portions of his empire, it was sort of fractioned up, but they did not have the ability to maintain the order and... and um, stability like Charlemagne, and they fell vulnerable to attacks, especially by the, by the Normans. But you see, out of that sort of dust of the Carolingian Empire, which came to an end, they'll be forged a new dynasty of Saxon rulers, some of whom will take the name Otto, and that will become the Ottonian dynasty, or Ottonian Empire, which will inherit the Carolingian Empire. They'll expand the boundaries, moving in the, in the direction of the uh, northeast well, uh, areas of Germany. And, you know, very significantly, um, in the year 1000, Otto III is going to rediscover the tomb of Charlemagne. See, the city of Aachen had been attacked by the Normans. And the exact location of Charlemagne's tomb, remember, he's buried inside his chapel, it was lost. They didn't know where it was. And very famously, on the Feast of Pentecost in the year 1000, Otto III sets out with the archbishop to uncover the tomb. They lock the doors and they finally, they, they, they search until they find the tomb. Once they find the tomb, they open it up. And according to some accounts, they discover Charlemagne seated upright on a throne, crown on his head, scepter in his hand, a gospel book on his lap. That was the coronation gospel book that I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation. And what Otto III does very cleverly is he removes the insignia, the crown, the scepter. He removes that gospel book and he closes the tomb, leaving Charlemagne inside. And Otto III will use that insignia as legitimization and justification to declare himself a Holy Roman Emperor. Fast forward a little bit. In the year 1165, Frederick I Barbarossa is going to dig up Charlemagne's body once again for the second and last time. And then he's going to arrange for Charlemagne to be canonized. Many people don't realize Charlemagne is a saint. I revert to Saint Charlemagne. And it will be during the reign of Barbarossa, Frederick I Barbarossa, that we'll get the term a holy empire. It doesn't really happen in the time of Otto, right? The Ottos, they consider themselves a holy Roman emperor, but the holy Roman empire is something that comes about in a diploma issued by Frederick I Barbarossa around 1155. And you know, why I'm explaining that is because you know, it's really fascinating history because this is the foundation for that Holy Roman Empire which will endure until the year 1806, right? When Francis II abdicates to Napoleon and that brings the um, Holy Roman Empire with those Holy Roman Emperors to an end. All right. I thought for tonight it'd be nice to close with a prayer that comes from the Canticle of Simeon which was part of the office of Compline, something that came out of the monastic complex associated with Benedict. Normally this is read responsibly, but since I'm alone, I'll read both passages. So this is sort of the evening prayers at the end of the day before going to sleep. And this canticle, the text of it is based upon the Gospel of Luke and was formally incorporated into those nighttime prayers. Lord, now let your servant go in peace. It's known as the nunc dimittis. Right? Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Mine own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. And the antiphon, protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep that awake we may keep watch with Christ and asleep rest in his peace. I wish you all a peaceful night's rest. Thank you for tuning in.